You know, we're the topic of the course is openness in education. Wh when you think about the word open and how it relates to your work, what does it mean and how, how did open enable what you, were, what you were doing here? So one of the things that I've uh, perhaps unintentionally been fairly aware of, even at quite a young age, was being perplexed at uh, what I know in relation to what others know and mm -hmm. the gaps between what I don't know. And I've tried various times to try and articulate that. Uh, you know, I, I did a, a you know, sort of a self-published text, Knowing Knowledge, that was an exploration of that. I've produced an article prior to that, you know, called Ideas as Corridors, but it was this fascination with, I know things that are different from what you know. How can we synchronize those for the benefit of both of ourselves? And it's a statement that I know you've made as well, but it's this idea of an idea shared isn't an idea lost. It's not like I have a dollar, you have a dollar. You say, George, give me your dollar, now you have two, I have none. I have an idea, you have an idea. We share, we each have two ideas now. And, and it's a very, very simple, like that's as complicated as the math gets with sharing. And so for my view of openness is exactly, it's very simplistic. It's this, if I have an idea to express myself, if I have a, an, an infrastructure to share what I know, and if there are corrective mechanisms within that infrastructure that provide feedback to the users of that infrastructure, that's all you need for global knowledge generation. And there have been many illustrations of where this has happened. So you might recall, uh, you know, well over a decade ago, about 15 years ago now, at the outbreak of the SARS uh, epidemic, this was an example of networked global knowledge creation. And it couldn't have happened in closed circles. It was basically a group of scientists around the clock from, you'd have CDC in Atlanta, would pass it over to an, uh, an office in Winnipeg, would pass it over to an office in Hawaii, would pass it over to an office in Japan and China and so on. And so in a very, very short period of time, the, the nature of SARS and the coronavirus as its origin was solved globally through scientific, uh, scientists sharing through networks. So when you ask the question of, of why openness in this kind of a, of a networked uh, context, I think that's the heart of it. It's the ability to solve complex problems that are novel in our era. Mm -hmm. And we simply cannot solve them with a hub and spoke model of the expert. Uh, we, we need to uh, solve them at this more distributed central approach. So I think for my interest, especially around knowledge, is the ability to take advantage of what each person knows and to surface that. For you to be able to declare what does David Wiley know and then for me to come along. And, and you have to declare it in something that's physically or, or some, something that instantiates it. It could be a blog post, it could be an image. Once you've done that, and this could be just as you're learning, you create an artifact. That artifact is a teaching instrument for me when I come across it. I remember when you were first grappling with four R's at that time, and I remember you wrote a post about this is what I think the four R's are. It was succinct, it was very effective. I immediately integrated it into a course I was teaching in Athabasca at that time. And then over time, as your thinking evolved and seeing talks that you did, you know, you did a TEDx talk in New York and a few other areas where you're talking about the imperative, the sort of the, the almost a moral dimension of teaching and learning and, and openly and so on. And this list, you know, th these kinds of activities kept going on. And I observed you grappling with this idea of openness and the rights and permissions and so on. And then eventually it became the fifth R. I had to update my syllabus. And, uh, but it, watching this process, was fascinating because it exactly exemplified the value of somebody who is learning transparently is a teacher. And that happens globally with networks. The problem is you have so many people learning transparently, you get a lot of garbage in there and you get a lot of stuff that's not relevant. And so then you need that feedback mechanism that, that helps to push things to the surface. So I think that's my vision for network learning for MOOCs and, and openness in education is that ability for transparency. So David, so far we've, we've really started to articulate some of the ways in which uh, open content makes education more affordable, more accessible, uh, it, but it has a big impact on the practice and the experience of being an educator. Namely, there is a pedagogical implication to using open education resources. And I mentioned there are some benefits there that it avails it to the network experience. Mainly, now we can teach with members globally, we can teach with, uh, students can learn, uh, more agency is required on the part of students to participate in that, and the list goes on. What have you seen, though, that has changed pedagogical practice? I mean, if I'm an educator thinking, oh, I think I'll teach online using open education resources, does this mean I have to rethink my entire teaching practice, or what is that experience like? Yeah, so the short answer to that is no. Um, it's very much like when you changed, I, I think all of us at some point had one of those Nokia brick phones, that then we switched from that to our first iPhone, our fir first oh, smartphone. Yes, very good. Yeah. 
Anyway. Um, when you make that switch, do you spend some period of time with that new phone only doing the things with that new phone that you used to do on your old phone? Because it doesn't occur to you that, oh, I want to take a picture, I should pull out my phone. Like, y that's not a thing that you do with a phone, right? Exactly. Um, so it takes you some time to kind of understand what the new affordances are and to start to really appreciate and, and operationalize those. Um, a lot of people, as they move make the move from commercial uh, to kind of traditional learning materials to OER, keep using OER exactly the same way that they used the old materials before. And it's only after a semester or two or three, or maybe they're at a conference that they hear uh, kind of somebody talk and tell an example of a compelling different way that they used OER, that they finally start to realize, oh, this is more than just a textbook. There are a lot of other opportunities here. So I, I think that's actually the typical pathway, yeah. is that as you adopt OER, you do exactly the same things with it you did before. And then over time, you start to expand out kind of the pedagogical repertoire. So with content, then, is it easy? Like if, if I'm going to, let's say I wake up tomorrow morning and I'm like, you know what? This OER bug, I got it. I'm going to use it. What do I do? So is it going to be easy? Am I just going to go find this, this land of uh, you know, honey and OERs and I just kind of throw stuff together and my kids will love me more, I'll have a happier marriage? I mean, what happens when you, when you want to start using OERs? So it depends on the discipline. There, there are definitely some happier marriage disciplines uh, where there's been so much work done, so much raw material created, so many efforts to pull those raw materials together uh, you know, where there's multimedia and now there are quiz banks and things like that, that you really can find something that you can essentially just adopt yeah. and use the same way that you did before. And that would tend to be in kind of lower level, higher enrolling, general education kinds of intro to psych, intro to social, bio for non-majors, college algebra, U.S. history, things like that. When you start to get up into graduate level courses or upper level uh, 400 courses, there's been less work done and so it becomes more of a working hard to find small pieces that you're pulling together yourself. You're really designing things uh, still and having a pretty heavy instructional design hand and how all that comes together. Um, where it's just more work. Yeah, yeah, and I think one of the things we're looking at this week in particular is uh, uh, partly at least finding mm -hmm. the OER materials that, we, or that, that we'd like to use in our courses. And one of your four R's, I mean the first one is this idea of reuse. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that it's easier to create OERs and just make them available than to actually reuse someone else's. And a little bit of that is, uh, I think, a natural uh, bias on the part of props, which is, I know my stuff, I'll yeah. create it, and somebody else will reuse it, but that often doesn't happen. But, uh, but if I do want to get started, you know, search engines, OER search engines, like what would you tell a faculty member that comes up and says, I'd like to start using more open content in my courses, never mind that next stage, which is like you just addressed, mm -hmm. the open pedagogy, the new teaching practices. So you start somewhere which most likely will be with open education resources. Mm -hmm. From there, it, as you progress down, it'll probably change how you teach, it'll probably yeah. have an impact to how you engage with students and so on. Uh, it'll in influence how you learn. But how, where would you, what would you tell a faculty member about starting points in this? You know, with a specific faculty member, I would ask what the discipline is, and then based on that answer, there are, there are places they could go. But a, a general answer to that, there's probably four or five kind of things that I would recommend in, in no particular order. Um, so at the, the University of Minnesota runs a project called the Open Textbook Library. And so they have kind of cataloged and indexed a large number of open textbooks. They've been... Uh, reviewed and those reviews have been put online. There are kind of five star ratings plus some qualitative descriptions about the books. And so that's a pretty big catalog and it's mostly comprised of things that look like traditional textbooks. So you're not pulling pieces together. It's just a large kind of slab of content that you can pick up and, and start to use. Um, you know, probably foremost in that collection is the work that's come out of OpenStax at Rice. Um, who've pr produced 25 or 30 complete textbook kind of replacements. All of those are cataloged in the open textbook library. But so that, that would be one kind of place to look if you're looking for something very textbook-like. Um, you know, the, the course catalog on Lumen's website, on our website, is m less textbook-like and more many resources from many places pulled together and, you know, their video, simulations, things like that, that, that wouldn't be quite as amenable to print maybe as what you might find in the, uh, in the open textbook library. But again, things that have been pulled together by faculty taught over several times at multiple institutions, kind of well-worn uh, or tried and true in that regard. Uh, 
I if you're a, a fan of Google and Google Advanced Search, uh, and Google does so good in just its basic search. Not many people use the advanced search capabilities of Google. But if you if you type advanced search into Google, the first result will be Google's advanced search. And from there, you can do some searching that down at the very bottom, the last constraint, the last filter, is a usage rights filter. And you can, uh, usage rights is a label. You can open that up and say, only show me things that are free for me to use, share, or modify. And that essentially then will tell Google to only give you search results that are Creative Commons licensed. And so you can actually use Google to search the entire web of CC licensed material. Um, you will find a lot of material searching that way. Um, and I, I've found that typically kind of the best way to use that is if you have a class where you've got well-developed learning outcomes, just take the whole learn stick the whole statement of the learning outcome in that search box and then search that way. If you just search for photosynthesis, y you're just going to find so you, you're going to drown in resources. Uh, and then probably at another place that, uh, particularly if you're looking for K-12, but, uh, but also higher ed, but I think the, the site that does the nicest job on K-12 is OER Commons, uh, which has some filters uh, that lets you kind of search by grade level, by subject area, things like that. So I I a general answer I think is hard to provide, but that's, that's kind of where I would say to begin. I think a teacher, when they start using OERs as well, one of the things that starts to become important is sort of the bridging language or the glue or whatever you want to call it. If, if you use an entire text, of course, you're, you're adopting a coherent, cohesive uh, Ostensibly, set of, yeah. yeah, in theory, a uh, set of, uh, of uh, resources to teach or bring into a classroom. The, there's, a, a, I think, a fascinating relationship uh, between uh, how coherent the knowledge object is and its general reuse capability, meaning a textbook is pretty big. You kind of adopt the whole thing. You're not going to just adopt one paragraph out of page 300 uh, for, a di for an e-text. When you have more granular objects, they have greater capability for reuse mm -hmm. because you can sort of plunk them and move them in any part of the course. The difficulty, though, is that granular size also adds to perhaps a less coherent mm -hmm. learning Resource. This is what we used to call the reusability paradox. Yeah. yeah. And so, so the difficulty uh, with that, actually before you even go there, why don't you explain the reusability paradox the way that you conceived it? Yeah, uh, and it's very much the way you described it, just that there's an inverse relationship between the kind of instructional capability of a resource, and by that I mean how much it's actually capable of teaching. And that has to do with the amount of context in it and the number of examples that are given, and it, uh, maybe roughly think of it as its size. Um, and the ease with which it can be reused. And so the, the larger, more kind of robust, richer resources that can do more teaching kind of standing alone are harder to reuse, while a single image of the Mona Lisa, really easy to reuse in thousands of places, but by itself doesn't actually teach very much. So there's this kind of inverse relationship between uh, in instructional function and ease of reuse. And so from a faculty or a teacher, end uh, when you're deciding to use some open education resources in your course the more granular you go the more you will need to add that coherent narrative that pulls these pieces together and I think from that end in particular it, it is a good opportunity you explore a range of different resources I had a colleague at Athabasca that was looking at uh, teaching a green technologies course and did the exactly suggested, decided to pursue Google and found uh, a university that actually had a complete green technologies course, 100% uh, you know, available online. It was uh, openly licensed and rather than produce the entire course, just said, ah, <laughs> we're, we're gonna do this and just brought the whole course in yeah. and I mean taught the, that. The, the, the permissions granted by open licenses are the escape hatch from the reusability paradox. The reusability paradox, as it was originally conceived back in the old learning object days, if you remember all of that fun, uh, assumed that there, you couldn't modify materials in any way. The assumption was everything was copyrighted and your, uh, kind of everything that you could do is pick different resources and sequence them in different ways. And that was kind of the total amount of control that you had over them. Um, but if you, can ha if you have a big resource that has some in internal coherence and it's openly licensed, now you don't have to make choices about this big resource doesn't actually fit into my context, so I'll have to go find a different big resource that's better. You can just open that resource up and make some changes to it internally to make it better fit uh, your context. So openness really actually just gets you out of that reusability paradox altogether.